there's no music if you have no body to play it with. So take care of your body first. You getting into the gym and you lifting weights and working on muscles is it's physical therapy for the benefit of your playing. The truth is nothing works like just taking care of the simple stuff. Diet, exercise and sleep. Take care of that and you'll be fine. Join us as two musicians and fitness coaches discuss strength, wellness and fitness in relation to musicians, artists and performance. Hey there, welcome back to the Tuned and Strong podcast. This over here is Angela McHuston of Music Strong. And I am joined by Dr. Jen Cabas May of Tuned and Tone Performance. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Kelly Malno Wilson, which thank you for the, the way you said your name. I was just going through, you could watch it, couldn't you? Going through my right. head. <laughs> Should I go to the mall? No, I like that, Malno. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So thank, thank you, you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Yes, the name, you can probably tell that I was a middle school teacher for 10 years. And that's my age of choice for working with students is I just love middle school kids. They would always say my name mall now. And I would say no, I can I go to the mall? No. And then that <laughs> solved it right there. <laughs> Done. Easy. Um, yep. Just take the W off. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's oh, solves no. all the problem. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, um, yeah. Can you describe like what you do and what I um, do? Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of things that I do, um, a lot of different lanes that I run in, and a lot of balls that are plates that are juggling. You know, at any given time, uh, some better than others. Yeah, but that's kind of how we roll around here. Um, I was originally a band director. Uh, middle school and high school band director in Worcester City Schools in Ohio for 10 years. Uh, also, I have a, my master's degree is in flute performance from The Ohio State University. Uh, so I've been teaching flute since I was an undergraduate. So that's a lot of a lot of years now. Uh, mm -hmm. That has never stopped. That's the one thing that's been consistent. Um, I became a licensed uh, body mapping educator in 2007. Um, and it's kind of shifted gears to do uh, more of that. I left the public school teaching world because I had two kids and uh, my husband is an engineer. I was a high school band director and I worked twice as much for half as much money as he was making. So it was kind of the, the right decision at the time. Um, I have been teaching a wellness class for musicians at the Oberlin Conservatory every semester since 2016. Um, that takes up a good um, hunk of time. Um, I also work with body mapping students, clients. I guess we call them students in that um, in that kind of modality um, around the world now. That was I found that that was really a cool thing with the. Um, uh, all the virtual stuff that we had to learn, even what we're doing now, um, that I was able to work with students all around the world. I have two body mapping students now they are in Australia. Um, I have worked with people that are in the UK. Uh, so that would never have happened if it wasn't for the pandemic because I would never have wanted to learn how to use Zoom and all of this stuff that we have to do uh, now. Uh, through my work teaching uh, college kids at Oberlin, I realized that Body mapping wasn't going to solve all of their issues. That that's just a tool. It's one tool that you can use. And I, while I knew a lot of stuff, I didn't have any tool that gave me a license to put hands on people and help with manual release. Um, I have been an athlete my life, whole life. I played basketball and soccer and um, high school. I coached volleyball, never played that, but coached, <laughs> coached volleyball in the middle school. They, well, it's an interesting story. Uh, probably you don't need, need to know. Well, it's funny. The, the, uh, the head volleyball coach at the time found out that I had coached eighth grade boys basketball. And she said, if you can do that, you can do this. I'm 5'2", okay? So they're all bigger than me. I'm like, oh, okay, seventh grade, I don't know how to do it. She said, I can't, here's the secret. You never demonstrate with the ball. You just do your arms. And I'm like, okay. And she, at that point, the high school girls were routinely winning the state tournament. <laughs> like, okay, teach me how, you know, so I did. Um, 
That's actually where I became fascinated with movement, was how come some of these girls can get it over the net and some can't? What's different? Like, oh, it's their arm swing. It's how they're not um, coming through with their upper body. Um, that led me to body mapping. And then I thought, wow, isn't this weird that I study my little basketball kids and my volleyball kids in ways with eyes that I never applied to my little band kids? And hmm, what would happen if we kind of um, moved into that playground. So that was that was really interesting. Anyway, segue back to uh, not having a, a hands-on therapy. Um, body mapping, the, the big point of body mapping is teaching applied anatomy. Like if you understand how you're supposed to, your body is supposed to move, they have a better chance of doing that. If you don't have some sort of muscular imbalance or some sort of compensation going on, if you've got something like that, it doesn't matter how clearly you think you can conceive of your movement, it isn't gonna happen. And so I found I can see things and I know that this is the problem over here, but I didn't have anything to um, address that. While I was kind of muddling about what I wanted to do for that, I ended up um, herniating a disc in my back and started oh. seeing a therapist who was trained in something called neurokinetic therapy, NKT. And I went to him one time and I decided, this is what I want to do for my musicians. This is the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is you have to have some other kind of license. So the people that take that training are uh, their PTs, their massage therapists, uh, their personal trainers, um, there's some yoga teachers. They all have, well, the yoga teachers are kind of in their own uh, mm -hmm. category. They can't do the hands-on release, uh, but I needed to get some type of a certification license that allowed me to legally do that in the state of Ohio. So the fastest thing was to go back to school for a massage therapy degree. And so I never wanted to do what we call fluff and buff massage. <laughs> like not, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, not interested in that at all, uh, but I needed that uh, anatomy knowledge and I wanted the hands on how do I release that. So uh, what neurokinetic therapy helps you to do is find where is uh, a muscular compensation happening and then how do we fix it and how you fix it is is based on what your modality is so chiropractors mm -hmm. will do their crunchy crunchy thing uh, massage therapists will do like pin and stretch or mm -hmm. you know and um, for yoga teachers they can't do hands-on but they can do releases with the yoga tunic balls or stretches or, or whatever so really how you accomplish the release work that's up to you based on your credential mm -hmm. So, like in a perfect world, I would have all these things happening. I would have this giant center that musicians who are in pain can come and work with me. And there would be like um, personal trainers like yourselves that work over here. There would be a chiropractor over here. There would be a mental health specialist. There would be this big uh, place like one stop shopping that people can come and get all of their uh, questions answered and find the actual people and the combination of those people that's going to work uh, to help. That's kind of awesome you just said that because I'm working on making that happen here in Nashville right cool. now. Cool. Ah, it's a shame you're not in Ohio. Oh. <laughs> Tennessee. Right. Yeah. You're on my referral yeah. list for sure. Okay. Cool. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad to hear other musicians are thinking the same thing. Need yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's quite that's quite the different way of coming about it because I've actually I have so many questions, but NKT is something that I found out about and I was just blown away. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the missing link. And so I went to a class in Ottawa, Canada, and everybody's like, why are you here? I'm like, because <laughs> I've never been to Canada and this is a good excuse. <laughs> and I went, yeah, okay. You know, it means there's no continuing ed near me, but there wasn't anyway. Right. And I was like, right. yeah, I'd rather yeah. go there than Chicago. So I'm like, why not? Okay. So I used it as an excuse to travel and it was just the coolest class, but boy, did your brain hurt after two days, just stuffed oh, yeah. full of, wow, so much anatomy. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. but it's brilliant in how the brain works and how the body, you know, how the body will remember a trauma and then create a new movement pattern that no longer serves you. It did in the moment, but now it might be holding you back from something else. And then how you can fix that. It's like, boom, instant pain release. Yes. It's I mean, really we're, cool. We're all walking around functionally dysfunctional. Yeah. All yeah. the time, every day. And it's only a problem when it gets to a certain point and then it shows up with, oh, it hurts now or, you know, or something. And then, oh, okay, then we need to have a strategy to actually uh, get in there and, and help get rid of that 
compensation. You know, because the comp yeah. why do we compensate? Because we need to. If you mm -hmm. have a broken arm and you have the universal hurt kid pose, there's a reason, uh, you know, for that. And then mm -hmm. after that's healed, you they need to be able to say, okay, all of you guys over here, you can calm down. You don't need to mm -hmm. be doing that, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. So I'm, I'm going to interrupt here just for a second because this is, we had, um, Oh my God, Lee. Lee. We had Lee come in and talk to us about body mapping. Um, oh. And most people are pretty familiar to some degree with what massage therapy is, even if it's the mm -hmm. fluff and buff version, like you said, I love that uh -huh. term, by the way. Um, but <laughs> I don't think we've <laughs> talked about um, neurokinetic therapy on the podcast since like episode one, when you and I were originally yep. talking. So just for people who are listening, um, do you want to kind of unpack what, like, what is it? If I'm a what brand new person. What do you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, I'm not doing <laughs> like, hmm. um, okay. So, uh, neural kinetic therapy uses, um, manual muscle testing, which is a technique that's used by a lot of people met, um, PTs typically use that, um, for strength. Like, for example, if they're testing your quad strength, they may have you with your leg up in the air and they're like pushing, 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 and they're adding a lot of weight. They're looking to see where, um, like how, like where, where do you lose your edge? Where, where mm -hmm. do you, ha where do you just mm -hmm. tap out? Um, the tests are done in an entirely different way with NKT mm -hmm. because what we're looking for is a software connection. Like, can your brain find uh, this pattern and fire it at the right time? Because the mm -hmm. brain doesn't think in muscles, the brain thinks in patterns. And mm -hmm. so even if we're doing, like say I'm doing a test for um, your bicep, I'm not only testing your bicep, there's all this other stuff that has to be on and engaged in the right time in order for you to pass that test. So it's a mm -hmm. very, very light testing. And if you push, mm -hmm. if I, me, the uh, practitioner, if I push too hard, it can completely mess up the whole quality of the testing. So it's very, very sensitive. Um, through your hands. So what I'm looking for is um, where can I find um, a pattern based on my testing where there is a muscle pair. So there will be one that is working too hard and another one that's not working hard enough. And so you got to figure out, okay, which two are paired and then which one is which. Because it's not always the one that is super tight isn't always the one that needs to be released. Sometimes mm -hmm. that one is mm -hmm. hanging on like crazy, compensating for a whole bunch of other stuff that's not working. And yeah. so the idea is um, as you progress through your NKT training, um, you get more and more kind of like Jedi level at level three that gets you um, some really cool tools that you can assess um, ligaments and scars and other stuff. Like basically, if you can touch it from the outside, I can assess it and try to figure out what's going on, like neurologically with that structure. And we pair it. It's cool. It's really cool. And you, when you find your pair, what you then do is like, okay, the one that's working too hard, hey, you got to calm down. So you release that one. And then the one that's not working, now you need to activate you, need to teach you, like not you, but yes, you need to step up to the plate and do your turn. Mm -hmm. And then the client has homework to do uh, based on that. So as a teacher, I really, really like this modality because it's giving the client the ability mm -hmm. to retrain their own brain to solve mm -hmm. their problem instead of taking a pill or doing a magic exercise or doing, you know, or, or or whatever, like the, the, you know, you give them, here's the homework, here's what you need to do. Release this for, you know, activate this and do it many times a day and they want because it's not loaded. They're not gonna hurt themselves. If they have any pain at all, then they've passed their edge and they need to stop. Anyway, so it's really a very safe um, thing to, for the people to do as long as they're following the directions. Like sometimes musicians aren't good that way, right? Like you tell them, yeah. I want you to do a little bit more. And then they come in and say, yeah, I did five hours more. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. no, 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 that's not <laughs> what I want you to do. You know, <laughs> and yeah, that kind of fits with musicians though, because we want to please, please the conductor, please the teacher, please the audience, please the, you know, like kind of this externally motivated kind of Mm -hmm. stuff that I wish we didn't all have, but it seems to kind of go along with a lot of things in our profession. Yeah, we just had that conversation with Lee as <laughs> well. <laughs> exactly the same thing. Like, well, oh, that just was a continuation, wasn't it? Yeah, it's so, <laughs> When you said like you get to like 
So like level three, you're getting into Jedi stuff. I mean, you're not mm-hmm. kidding. I mean, scars. Mm-hmm. That was that's mm-hmm. pretty fantastic. Well, like, but what about you know, eyes? Isn't there something about oh, yeah. eyes? There's there's an eye protocol in there, yeah, that goes along with concussion. So if your eyes aren't converging at the same time, that that you can be having all sorts of of stuff related to that. That is. That's brilliant. Yeah, I've not ever done worked on anybody's eyes because it kind of, I get a little bit freaked out because you're like, eh, kind of like touching like around the eyes. And because I don't like it, I don't test very well. Like I, my, my own junk is influencing with, <laughs> like where yep. I use that a lot is with um, flute, well, um, flute players. A lot of flute players have um, TMJ type pain, crackle, snap, crackle, pot kind of thing. Mm-hmm. and. Um, you can work with uh, like the the hyoid bone. You can work mm-hmm. with the joint capsule. You can work with all these muscles in their face and find out, okay, why is your jaw pulling to the left and what can we do so that it can open just, you know, straight down. And the beauty of those things is I don't need a table. I don't need anything. I just need the person sitting in a chair and I can do my stuff without having to have a whole, you know, <laughs> office of stuff to carry around. Having said that, Mm -hmm. it is much easier when you actually have a table and you can put people on the table. But I learned, (laughs) I learned pretty early on that, wow, in order for this to be effective with musicians, I have to learn how to test them seated. Mm. And and one of my um, master teacher, uh, well, colleagues and friends um, test this way, which is really cool, but none of the NKT training, all of the tests are done flat on your back. Yep. Right? And so like, it's the same thing, but you have to think, okay, if I would test this person here, how do I do that when they're sitting up? And then where do I have to stabilize and how do I move mm-hmm. around them? I'm not very big. So when I have big clients, mm-hmm. it's hard because they're bigger than me and I can't really physically, <laughs> can't always uh, get to them in the way that I want. Um, but you know, so I just started to learn that and then the pandemic happened and I had just gotten keys to my new office space, which is right across the parking lot from Oberlin, which is in a shared space in this yoga place and campus shut down and we were shut down for the rest of that year. And I taught completely remotely the next year. And then now we're back in the classroom, but they're very conservative and everybody is still masked and way socially distant and nobody wants to have a hands-on therapy. So it's the wrong time to start trying to build that uh, practice, but it's hopefully getting like, like the next couple months, you know, continues to move in the right direction. So I'm hopeful, but time will tell. Talk about timing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm also very exceeding. I feel I should say exceedingly lucky that um, that my husband has a good job and he makes enough money that we don't have to that I don't have to try to support us by doing that because that would have been really very very challenging mm-hmm. uh, time for the last couple of years. A lot of the people that I do know through the NKT community had a really hard time, and a lot of them have actually end, ended up leaving the profession for a while to get some other kind of job because they need to eat. Yeah, <laughs> they need to pay bills. I didn't yeah. test into level one because I would I was second guessing myself. I was putting off the test until I felt like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And then the pandemic happened. I was like, crap, I can't touch anybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's been two yes. years. I don't think I remember. <laughs> right. So you'd have to, you know, like, yeah. Okay. So you'd have to start over and you have to practice. You have to have, you, gotta um, you, you just, that's the only way you, um, you build the skill, just like everything else you do. You mm. got to practice. You got to have hands on live bodies to get that, you know, feedback. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when when you say you have to test them seated, um, is it is it more of like a the musicians won't do the lie down thing, or it's not effective? It's because if I'm in a classroom and I have usually where I end up using the NKT most at this point are kids in my class that have some sort okay. of thing going on, and they'll show up before class. Like, can you help me with this? I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't have my table in the classroom where I'm teaching. Okay. Mm-hmm. I can put them on the floor. Which is which mm-hmm. we do, but that's sort of weird because I can't. It, it's fine for them, but it's not good for me because I can't get the right angles and I'm crawling around yeah. on the floor and I can't get yeah. underneath them. And um, you know, for little like like yeah, ten minute like super fast like let's see if we can really just like dial in and fix this right now. It works, but for my own body use, I wouldn't be able to sustain that uh, for right. hours and hours of that because it's like. 
<laughs> just <laughs> like you yeah. really need the leverage of your feet on the floor and being able to mm -hmm. use their body weight um, into your yeah. hand instead of pushing. And when you're on the same level or higher than them, that's really hard. Yeah. Okay. So it's more a logistics thing and less yeah. uh, less a yes. fighting thing. <laughs> yes. I would love to put them on the table. That would be a perfect world is to always put them on the table because they're just laying down. It's a place of safety and it just, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but we don't always have that. So it's good to be able to be um, flexible so that you can do your stuff in, you know, any environment. Yeah. Very I think cool. Angela, didn't I end up working on you in the hallway at NSA? In the hallway. Yes. You did have me lie down on the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're going to test my psoas, and I don't know how you test a psoas in a seated position. That's that is no go. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's kind of yeah, kind of not. We really did. Accurate. That was yeah. uh, <laughs> that was in Orlando. That was like yeah. that was four years ago. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. That's, yeah. Wow. And all these people were walking by, like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> like, this is fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> so it's we're actually. What's funny is that um, Kelly is now on the the performance health committee, and that was the year that I. I was started as chair of the performance health committee. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're, you're the first in a series. I just started reaching out to the members of the committee. I'm like, Hey, you want to be on the podcast? Like, yeah. So yeah, we're going to have a sure. whole series. I think we have sure. five of them. Yeah, like, cool. yeah. Tales from the yeah. PHC. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. That's the, the performance health care committee of the national flute association for anybody who wants to know what that stands for. But yeah. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. And I went, I went to Ottawa right after that. And it was just, I was like, I've got to find a way to do this. So I raised the money and it's not a cheap class and it's not a cheap trip, but it was, oh, so worth yeah. it. I mean, I really wish it had gone more than two days, more like three, four days would have been great because uh -huh. you really delve into the anatomy so in detail. And if you don't know the anatomy or you're rusty on it, you're going to be way overloaded right. more than you would have been. It's just, yeah. it's just a lot. I mean, we're talking like individual fingers, individual toes, yeah, a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. and and you have to be able to think it on the fly. So you're thinking, okay, I got a problem with a hip flexor. Where do my hip flexors live? Which ones are they? Like, okay, and then which ones are the functional opposites? Yes. Of my hip flexors. Okay, and which ones are the contralateral? Well, it's like, okay, wait, what? And then, and then you start thinking better, bigger patterns and like, okay, wait a minute. I got to stop and go back and think, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so that's, you have to, there's a, you have to be fast. And that's where I find that, oh yeah, I know the anatomy on paper. And I get in there like, hmm, first two choices don't pan out. Like, hey, eh, what's the yeah. third choice? Like, let me go back to the book because in the back, there's this little like cheat sheet kind of sort of thing that has yep. um, muscles by group. Like, oh yeah, I got to check. Boom, I got to check this one. And then there, it will be there. You know, so the answer is always there. Um, but sometimes it takes takes longer <laughs> to get there than, than you want. And, eh. Yeah. Tell me about it. So yeah. actually, you actually, on, a, on another note, um, so as a, it, it's just cool that you've got this, this cool health background, but you're also a flutist. And um, you had a hand injury, right? I did. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is actually kind of funny. Like we're going to go with like the injury, <laughs> like the, like the, uh, we, I had a, my first class at Oberlin for this semester was just two weeks ago because we started really late and, um, turns out that everybody had had some sort of significant like broken bone story like which like the complete land of the misfit toys <laughs> like everybody like wow like, you guys are a mess like lots of stuff to work on here um but yeah myself included it seems like i keep on getting these injuries from the universe that exist to make me a better teacher and and more um empathetic human being <laughs> i guess yeah the hand one was the big one that um set me yeah it took it took a long time to get over that um to make a very long story shorter uh, i tried to switch to an offset flute because i wanted to get a big girl flute and i had always heard that ooh, offset is better for people with small hands and i'd played in line my whole life with no problem after about two days it became very apparent that oh, no this is not happy in my hands and um yeah, just lots of lots of pain um, through here, through the side of the MCP joint. Like why, like not stable this way. Like what's going on with that? Stopped playing that instrument, got it switched out 
for an inline instrument, all happy, getting better, played the recital, and then I slipped over top of my kid who was like three or four in the bathtub and I fell down and went with my hand on the curve of the bottom of the bathtub. And when I did that, there was an audible, like a, like a snappy thing, like, oh, not good. Like something like, uh, some, like not good, not oh, good yeah. right here. Like something is, mm. You know immediately and, something yeah, is not. Yeah, twang, just that, like the sound of it. Like, meh. Um, so then you had to go to see like doctor after doctor, doc, you know. Um, ultimately what I ended up doing was I ruptured the sagittal band, which is the connective tissue that goes over top of the extensor tendons. So when mm -hmm. I would bend here, this tendon would go into this valley of doom and it would mm -hmm. kind of sort of stay there. And it was also, uh, there was damage over here to the radial collateral ligament, which is why it's not stable this stable. way. Yeah, so um, it was a, a surgery to go in and rebuild that. And um, it was actually the best case because this, this ligament over here on the side, um, it wasn't actually um, ruptured. It was just kind of stretched out. So they could kind of called it plication, kind of like eh, eh, tighten that up. But this one, sagittal band, completely ruptured, like, like the other part was over here. So they had to sew that back together and, you know, wow. um, splinted and then, you know, working forever to get to be, I still can't actually, like, that's what I got. You know, I don't have full range of motion there. And for flutus, we have to be able to hyperextend back this way. And I just can't, that's yeah. no longer available to me. It's not uh, going to be back. It makes piccolo a real problem. Whoa. So I can't do piccolo very much at all. Um, alto flute is fine because- That's gotta bigger, be your friend. You know, it is, yeah. And so it's, it's okay. So. Um, oh, let me stop of... you for one sec. So for those who are just listening to this, she's talking oh. about the index finger of her left, her left hand. And if you're looking at quote, first knuckle. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. guy. Yeah. Like the base of support. <laughs> like, right. That's kind of a big deal that you mm -hmm. need that. Um, yeah. So then, um, I learned a lot about hand therapy and I learned <laughs> that, um, I'm a little bit weird because I wanted to know, like, where is the muscle? Like, what muscle is supposed to be activating for this thing that you're asking me to do? Mm -hmm. And that's, most people don't want to know that. Like, I really want to know. I was surprised at how much, um, how much atrophy there was just up here in my forearm. Like, why do I have to do, like, wrist flexion? Like, oh, because you can't do it, dummy, because you've been mm -hmm. casted and restricted for, a, you know. Um, and then when I did eventually get back to playing, it was, I can play my flute for one minute. And then I can play my mm -hmm. flute for two minutes. I'm like, okay. And so what are you going to do with this two minutes? And then noticing like, wow, I'm a trained body mapping teacher. I have been teaching this stuff for years. And I put my flute in my hand right after the surgery. And the, my awareness goes right to here, to the injured spot, leaving out the, all of the rest of my body. And so friends would mm -hmm. say, hey, um, are you holding your breath? Like, I don't know. I'm thinking about what's happening with my hands. <laughs> like, what's going on with your pelvis? I don't know, because I'm, oh, you know, going right to where the injury is, which was what happens after we're injured. That's another compensation, you know, um, strategy. Um, yeah. I also became, through that uh, process, a big believer in modifying the instrument when it's possible. Um, fortunately for me, uh, one of my colleagues at Oberlin Conservatory is Alexa Still, and she is amazing. She's one of the most humble and generous, amazing humans on the planet. And she um, makes all sorts of stuff to put on her students' flutes. And so she helped me figure out all sorts of things and intermediate strategies and other stuff uh, to be able to play. And so one, I thought we could do like some Frank, I, have, I call my flute like a, a Franken flute because it has so much weird stuff on it and I forget and then I go somewhere and people are like, what's all that junk on your flute? And so <laughs> probably like the most important thing, I'm gonna try to hold this up to the camera upside down. So this is a piece of cork. Oh, wow, I can't even find the camera because it's upside down and backwards. <laughs> this thing here, okay, and it's just, well, let me turn it around this way so you can kind of, see, hmm. How does that work? Can you actually see that? Yeah. Okay, so what it does is it creates a flat spot on a round tube. 
and so mm -hmm. that it allows more of the weight of the flute to come into my right thumb and off of my left hand. And she custom makes these. And so she has a little Dremel tool in her office and she's got the little protective goggles and you know, so she measures and then sands and measures and you know, and you're like, okay. So this is kind of a big one. Um, like big, like sticks out. I also have one on my alto, which is humongous. Um, so that really helps. Um, the second thing is when I first started back to playing, this finger over here could only come here. So mm -hmm. I had a key extension that was a little plastic thingy that stuck out over here so that I could be here. I don't need that anymore, but I do need a little bit of key height and it needs to be offset a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that is a saxophone pearl key that is <laughs> on there with double side sticky tape. So mm -hmm. it just makes a little bit higher um, key height to match. That's the shape that I can do. Like here is what I used to sort of be able to do. And I can't, I cannot do that um, for any length of time. And since I was altering stuff, I, I had the foot joint altered. I by love your John footprint. by John Lund. So this is an angled keynote cluster and it's actually measured for my pinky finger so that it kind of works only for me. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like whatever. Um, so I had other things in there and um, this, uh, the left hand index finger, adding some key height on that. I've actually used that with a lot of students who have little, really small hands. And what we do is we just tape a button a button onto that key and then we'll see how that works. And if they don't like it, they can just take it off. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, Franken flute. And then my, my alto <laughs> flute has all of the same stuff on it. And except for the key height, I just actually had my repair tech just, just bend the, bend the key up because it's just an extension anyway. So it's, it's fine. It's good. It's happy. Um, I had to also learn that, um, I can't just practice for hours and hours anymore. Like my time is limited. So I have to be very um, cognizant of what are you gonna do with the 35 minutes that you have here and how are you gonna be really efficient with time? Because you know, I can't, eh, if I am playing for like an hour, hour and a half on a day, that's a lot for me. And so when I'm done teaching my students, even though I have flute in my hand, like that's still, that's hard some days at the end. And I'm not even playing anything, you know, hard, but like, oh, mm -hmm. I had, I learned a lot about um, mental practice and how valuable that is and goal, well, goal setting and writing stuff down and being, and trying to find the most efficient ways of practicing the little chunks as I could. Um, yeah. And so that's helpful for actually sharing that stuff with um, all of my students, especially my college students, because they, um, my, my class started out as a body mapping class and it's still called intro to body mapping, but it's really body mapping and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we do a lot of self care um, in that class. And I tell them right in the beginning on day one that, you know, it's your career and you're the one in charge and I don't really care how that works because that's up to you. I'm not in charge of it. I can give you the, um, the tools, but you have to be responsible. And they kind of really sit up and take notice because there's like, what, you don't care about me? Like, no, nope, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. Like you have to be the one who cares the most about, about yourself. And so as it, as time has gone on, we end up doing a lot more with uh, performance anxiety. I have them do movement explorations, which is basically just range of motion, like putting all your joints through range of motion um, during the day, instead of just sitting in this front position that we're in all the time. Um, I have them buy uh, yoga tune-up balls. I don't know if you know what those are. Um, here, they look like uh, kind of tennis ball size and they grip onto your skin. So we use these um, and I teach them how to, hey, if you've got a sore spot, you know, there are things you can do. Like for example, you can take this ball, you can whack it over here's the spot that is sore and then you can back up into a wall, like pressure in that. So what I'm teaching them is manual therapy, self-release mm -hmm. techniques that they can do with these and they don't have to use their hands. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of stuff, like they're finding that that's just super valuable. At the end of the semester, one of their, the questions on their final paper is, what's the number one takeaway idea from this whole semester? What's the, if you're gonna remember just one thing, what is that thing? 
And um, I've been really surprised by how many of them write down that it's this just the old, whole idea of self-care and that sometimes not practicing is the best way to care for yourself and that that is absolutely okay that to, to have mindful practice instead of mindless repetition which because they only have so many repetitions in your body and then then as a, as a massage therapist I can tell them like hey all of you athletes and musicians you are repetitive movers and I love to have you in my practice because you'll come back all the time because you won't stop doing what you're doing because it's your thing and and you're doing the same thing all day long every day which means that you just need um, maintenance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like hmm, I can help you with that, you know. And it's their job, you know, to um, go out and search for that. We we also talk about um, we don't so much do like strength training type of stuff because I'm not licensed to do that. Although I'm thinking highly about going back and getting a. a personal trainer um, cert to kind of actually sort of cover me legally for kind of some of the stuff that I'm already doing. Mm. <laughs> but Not a bad but for, idea. <laughs> well, in the state of Ohio, massage therapists can't prescribe exercise. In other states, they can. Yeah, so I can say, here's your homework. But I can't say, well, you need to go three set, do three sets of the, yeah. you know, like, eh, um, you know um, we do talk about strength, though, that there is a strength component to all this. So if you're this, I actually say, skinny little twerp that does nothing but sit here all day long, and then your back, your upper back hurts when you've done practicing for five hours, and you don't have a whole lot of, you know, muscular strength going on there, that's a problem. And here's who you can go see to help take care of that, because that is not okay for that to happen. And then like, oh. What you mean? It's okay for me to do a push up? Like, yes, it is okay for you to do a to do a push up. You know, like, <laughs> like yeah. That. Or you know, they have, they're concerned about wrist stuff. You know, like I do yoga and my wrist hurt. Okay, there's ways that if your yoga teacher knows what's going on, they can modify that. And, you know, that's okay. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, we have a lot of frank discussions in in my class mm. yeah so, so, so not fired yet so i guess it's okay <laughs> thank you and i keep coming back but yeah. i think this is a perfect time for us to take a quick break and we will be right okay. back with more of kelly hey musicians did you know that up to 90 percent of musicians will experience playing related pain or injury over the course of their career how many hushed conversations have you heard about a lingering quote shoulder pain or a weird tingling in your fingers or maybe low back pain or a crampy weakness, or maybe you or your colleague just says, I just have to get through the gig. And you watch them pop Advil like candy, maybe flush it down with whiskey. How many times have we seen something like this? So many, right? Well, it's time we start talking about our struggles, our pain, our frustrations in a private space where we don't just complain and mobilize and blindly stretch, but we learn how to strengthen our muscles, our career successes, and build each other up. I've got a brand new program that combines all of these things, and I want you to be a part of it. It's a community, not a workout. It's a community with group coaching and great content that in 12 weeks will have you understanding more about your body, what you need, and how you work so you can avoid that career-threatening injury. The three things that musicians don't want. We don't want to be injured. We don't want to have a lack of stamina. And... We don't want to be clueless, a.k.a. when you hurt, who do you go see? Just a quote doctor? Well, this program addresses all of those things. You're going to walk away with an immense knowledge of who to see. You're going to be empowered because you're going to know what to do should you ever get injured or should you have a colleague that gets injured. You will be able to actually offer appropriate advice. You're also going to learn about the body and the anatomy as it relates to playing your instrument and your own anatomy. And then you're gonna learn how to build not just your strength and endurance, but you're gonna learn how to design your own corrective exercise program. So I hope you will join me in this new program. It's called the Music Strong Pilot Program, Job Security for Musicians. Welcome back and we are with Kelly Malno Wilson. And we were just talking about um, her teaching at, at Oberlin and her wellness class and, um, 
you said something at the very end that I kind of wanted to go back to about these these frank discussions that you have with your students about um, the things that they're dealing with and, you know, also some performance anxiety, which I know is heightened now because of the pandemic and now we're, you know, it, it's just anxiety in general. But um, we were talking over the break about some things um, that you bring up about being your, like taking care of yourself and being your biggest advocate because, you know, and when are you allowed to be a musician? When are you allowed to take care of yourself? Self, you know, it's not always about what the teacher says, but what's your musical intention and what's you about, like, why would you wait for care? And it's about basically all about taking care of you and making sure that you know that you are the person who has to take care of you. Would that be correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, and in our very first class of the semester, um, I asked the students to give me a number, like, what do you think the injury rate is for professional orchestra musicians? Mm. Hmm. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. They start throwing out some numbers, and yeah, right there, I see it. Like 72 to 90 percent, depending on what study you look at. And that's for orchestral musicians, and the numbers, there's less research out for vocalists, but um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I'm not even going to say them. But I found like the recent study that had like vocal, vocal stuff, um, and then I put a statistic up. Okay, NCAA women's gymnastics injury rate for the year like 12.5 percent, and then for gymnastics. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah, for, for a few years ago, like, what? And then I have another one on the slide. Oh, oh Cirque du Soleil performance, like trapeze, aerial artists, and it's some other number that is not 72 to 90 percent. And I, and I should know this. See, if I were planning ahead, I would have them, my little slide. <laughs> uh, but, anyway, I can, I can send it to you and you can put it in like show note, like underneath or something. Um, and they're shocked and I'm like okay so why is this like why is this okay do you see a problem with this and they're like yeah yeah like what about OSHA standards anybody know that like, <laughs> like this is this is not this mm. is not okay um so then I say well why does this happen and they're like yeah, I don't know they don't they don't really want to say I'm like okay all right so the reality is that you it's not a question of if you're going to be injured in this business. You are going to be injured pretty much some point in your career. You're going to have a thing. And the choice then becomes how are you going to deal with that? And that is very much your choice. So if we go to the athlete world, um, if you have a professional athlete, let's say um, a football player and quarterback has a hangnail, the training staff knows about it. If there's anything wrong, like instant access to super high quality medical care. And if they need imaging, they're not waiting six weeks for a spot. If they need surgery, they're not waiting for the next the next two months for the next surgery spot. Uh, they get the surgery. They have access to fantastic rehab. They have all the nutritional stuff. They have the mental health piece. And the reason for this is because it's financial like that player is not making money for the team and for the organization if he or she is injured and not playing and so then we go back to musicians world okay you move just as much as they do you move for longer than they do because your average musician's career orchestral musician goes past the age of 40 when you know like you're just kind of like hitting it right so what do they have that we don't have and then they think about it like they have access to good health insurance they have access access to uh, high quality rehab. Um, they have, um, and why don't we have that? Well, because it's one of the things that is kind of not really so good about the culture that we live in. And well, the, the music, music world culture, where injury is a bad thing. Like we don't talk about it, mm -hmm. we hide it, we don't go to the doctor until we absolutely can't play anymore. And then say to my students, why? And they say, uh, because you need the gig, like exactly, because you need to play the show, play the gig so that you have the money to eat. And so you only stop when you can't do that. Um, there's a fantastic podcast episode with uh, Dr. Bronwyn Ackerman on Karen Bulmer's podcast, which is, I think, Move It, Music and Mind, or maybe Mind, I, it's those three. I don't know, but I can't remember the name of, of the, the whole thing. Um, but she talks about this issue really um, very directly and said most often, like many of these things that musicians have, it's easy to fix. 
if they get to the PT and the right professional soon enough. So, but because we wait, then it's a super big problem that's much more complicated uh, because there's this mindset like, I'm a terrible musician because I'm injured. The athletes, they do not have, I'm a terrible athlete because I got injured. That's almost to be expected in what, um, in their profession and not saying that they want that to happen, but it happens and they, they move on and then mm -hmm. they get better and they do the work and they get back to playing again. So if what I want my students to know is, oh, when it starts to hurt, like pain is not okay. That is your body requesting you to change something. It should never be okay. It's never okay to play your instrument and, or sing with pain, like period. like. It's not, and that kind of their eyes are like, what? I'm, most of the kids that are in my class are there because they're already in pain, because they have a thing that's kind of on their entry <laughs> thing. Like, and, I, and I know that, and they know that. So they're highly motivated to take the information to change. And so I throw it back in their court. Like you have to be the one that is in charge of your healthcare and getting to the right professional. And like, who cares if your studio professor says, oh, we'll just take a week off. Like you take a week off and is that any better? Then you need to keep going to the next professional, to the next one, to the next one, till you find the one who can help you with, with the problem. And um, that's a new level of responsibility for them. And it kind of ties right in with, okay, as a musician, you have choices to make about what kind of vibrato am I gonna use? How am I gonna shape this phrase? How am I gonna, what style are we gonna use? Body blah, 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 blah. Also, how am I gonna take care of my body? How am I gonna notice my body? What am I gonna do um, to help my body? Like, hey, maybe I should drink some more water instead of 14 Red Bulls before the, mm -hmm. uh, before the <laughs> performance. <laughs> Like maybe I need, you know, like maybe staying up to 3 a.m. and then on uh, every weekend, maybe that's not exactly working for you, you know? So uh, like all this stuff, like sleeping, nutrition, like hearing protection, you know, like all of this stuff is a choice. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make the choice, that's still a choice. Like you've, and it's, and it's their responsibility, not the teacher, not mom and dad, not grandma and grandpa, like, nope, you, the kind of like want to be grown up sitting here and it's <laughs> like this has to be something that's really high on your radar if you want to do this this job because this is a tough um, this is a tough business uh, to be for longevity because it's demanding and we don't have like support staff that all of the uh, we don't yet have the support staff that <laughs> all of the um, athletes have we're working so, on it yeah I think I think there should be a wellness professional attached to every major orchestra and every recording studio. Yes. I don't know why yeah. that's not mm -hmm. mandatory. Could be. Yeah. There's yeah. no, there's absolutely no excuse for those stats. Right. I mean, if the yeah. gymnastics team has like 12%. Yeah. Gymnastics? <laughs> right. Like, right. Really? Like, right. Like what, mm -hmm. what are we doing? <laughs> what we're not yeah. doing. And you, you just right. you hit the nail on the head. And we're not. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We're not. We're not doing. Well, I hate to cut this short. Uh, this has been, an incredible conversation, honestly. But yeah, thank you. You hit so many things. I mean, that's I'm I'm not usually this quiet on our recordings, but I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay. she's yep. got it. Yep, oh, you said it. got yep. it. Yep. Go. <laughs> so, cool. But no, cool. thank you for saying so many things that needed to be said, mm -hmm. um, and in ways that they needed to be said too, and and just giving us your time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's about transparency, right? That you have yeah. to know, like, if you just don't talk about like the the scary stuff then it just goes you know unaddressed and so i think that um even well a lot of times college students are able to make an intelligent decision like a rational decision when they have the information mm -hmm. you know when it's laid right out there like here you know they don't have to necessarily go search for it <laughs> here it is you know right. take it or right. leave it you know and and, and then ultimately you're just planting seeds so that in the future, like, oh, well, she said it shouldn't hurt. It's hurting. Oh, ding, ding. I need to do something. Like, that's a win when, when that happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Kelly, where can people find more about you if they want to find um, you? My website is precisionperformanceandtherapy.com. All, all one giant, giant word. Um, Perfect. Yeah. I have Great. I'm on Instagram, too, and I think it's... It's the same thing at Precision Performance and Therapy. <laughs> it's, just, really it's, long. I, it's really long. Like, okay, I sh I didn't, like I should have thought that through differently before, <laughs> before I did that. Um, That's yeah. okay. I also write, yeah. I write the wellness columns uh, for the Flute Examiner uh, online newsletter. So there are, I think like 42 articles on there now that are wellness related. Yeah. Um, 
you know, body mapping and also other other stuff on there as well, like short little, you know, read it in five minute type of things. That's, That's awesome. at theflutexaminer.com. Perfect. Cool. Well, we'll put all of that in the show notes and the slides, and we're going to get back cool. in touch with you and get that cool. podcast and the slides and all the other things that you mentioned. Um, those are going to be in the show notes. So thank you all for, thank you for watching and thank Good. you for coming. Good. Yes. Good. All right. Well, see, see you next time. Okay.